pavement, laying their cloaks on the ground and saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And he comes into Jerusalem and um, he goes to the temple and he's in the temple courts and he overturns the tables and drives out those who are buying and selling. And they would have been buying, and it would have been in the court of the Gentiles where this would have taken place. And Jesus says, my house will be called a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of robbers. And then he stays in the temple, and he begins to heal people. And while he's doing this, and it was customary, there were children kind of around shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. And that the children actually did that. They would kind of call out the important people in the, church, in, the, in the temple. But the religious leaders were really indignant. They were probably not happy that he'd cleaned out the court of the Gentiles from the buyers and sellers, which they made money off of. Um, he w- they were equally unhappy with the children announcing that da- Jesus was the son of David. And so Jesus is there, and then he leaves the temple, And he goes to Bethany for the night, and here we are the next day, and that's where we're going to begin this morning. And I'm going to start reading in uh, Matthew 21, verse 23. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they ask, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Then Jesus says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? The first they replied. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that it will speak into each of our hearts in a powerful way. We thank you for Jesus. We just, I am always in awe and amazement when I read what he says. For he is so far above us with wisdom. And I pray that this morning we will just grasp some of that wisdom. In his name we pray. Amen. And so I want to start by looking at Jesus is in the temple. The rulers from the day before are probably not super happy with him because he's clear, cleared out the temple and the children have been um, saying he's the son of David. And so they come to Jesus and they say, um, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Well, really... That is an unanswerable question. And you're going to say, oh, no, no, Marjorie, he just had to say it was from God. Well, we're going to see from the passage that that answer wouldn't have been acceptable. But more than that, saying that God gave me the authority, where is the proof? And you're going to say, oh, well, what he did, etc. But, you know, if you think about the curfew in Quebec, last week I was reading that someone got stopped at 4 a.m. in the morning, and um, she was on her way to work. And she had a letter, so she pulled out her letter and showed it to the police officer. And you know what he said? 
He said, well, how do I know you just didn't write it yourself and put it on a piece of letterhead? I don't have any proof. So CBC actually talked to lawyers about what would happen. And the lawyer said to them that if, do not argue with the police officers. If they will not accept your letter, take the ticket and fight it in court. So even though they had a letter, they thought they had authority, there was room for argument and debate. And I think that that's what the leaders are trying to do. They are still trying to catch Christ out. And they ask a question, and no matter what his answer is, they're going to argue and debate with you about it. Have you ever dealt with teenagers? They come up and ask you a question, and you know that it doesn't matter what you say, you're going to be in an argument and debate. And that's what this reminded me of. So Jesus is so wise. I wish I, just some days, I wish I'd used some of his techniques um, he decides that he will ask them a question because there's a prerequisite to their question. And the prerequisite is, what do you do with John the Baptist? What is your opinion of him before I will, t and his authority, before I will answer about my authority? And so he asks them whose authority, what, John the Baptist. Did it come from God or did it, it, was, did it come from John? Is it man? And I want you to really pay attention to what they said as they discussed it. Did they discuss what is the right answer and what is the wrong answer in terms of truth? They didn't. They discussed the answer in terms of perception. How their answer would be perceived, not whether they gave the right or wrong answer. When you're given two choices, a multiple choice, I hate multiple choice, by the way, um, they give you five choices and the last one is none of the above. Well, Christ didn't do that. He gave them two choices. There was no none of the above as an answer. So they had to make a choice. But instead of discussing, was it from heaven or was it from man, they discuss perception. If we say it was from heaven, then we're going to be in trouble because we didn't believe him. So people are going to perceive that something's wrong. And if we say it is not from heaven, then the people who believe John was a prophet are going to perceive we're wrong. And actually in one of the accounts in Luke, it said they were afraid they might even stone them. But their answer was not, inter they were not interested in the truth. They were not interested in the right answer. And you have to know that it bugs me because I like giving the right answer, even if it's not true. If I know what the right answer is and it doesn't apply to me, like, you know, one of these personality tests, I'm pretty good at figuring out what would be the best answer to give. And I have a real tendency to do that because I like to have be right. I like to give the right answer. It's just who I am. It doesn't make any logical sense. But they weren't interested in that. They were interested in perception. And I have to tell you that it took me till this morning to really grasp that because if you ask less what my current thing is with people in authority is that they are more concerned about perception than truth. I am sorry that you perceived what I did was incorrect. Are they sorry for what they did? Are they admitting that what they did was wrong? No. They're just sorry you perceived it wrong. And I can name, and I'm not going to, I can name multiple leaders in countries who are making those statements all the time. They are wrong and they are not willing to admit it. They just say it's your perception of my actions that is wrong. My perception of my action is that it was right. So I'm okay. It's your perception of my action, and with no regard to w absolute truth, whether it was right or wrong. And so I see that's what's happening with these men. They aren't interested in whether, really, whether John's authority was from God or from man. They're just worried about people's perception of them. They want to stay in power, and perception is, is the battle, and it's the battle today. And so Jesus says, well, then I'm not going to tell you because it's pointless. It won't matter what I say, where my authority comes from. You're not really interested in my answer. 
But you know, Christ never gives up. He doesn't give up on them, and he doesn't give up on us. He says, he engages them in the discussion. He says, what do you think? How many of us can resist that phrase? Somebody wants to know what I think. When Jesus says it to you, what do you think? You know you're in trouble. They didn't perceive that. And he tells a parable. And he says, a man has two sons. And he goes to the first one and says, son, go in the work today in the vineyard. We need to notice a couple of things as we look at this parable. First, that the father goes to the sons individually. He does not go to them together. It's not a collective thing. Um, will son A do it or will son B do it? He goes directly to son, the first son. And that's exactly how God deals with us. He deals with each one of us individually, irrespective of those around us. It is a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. And second thing I want you to note is that he's asked to go work in the vineyard. His father didn't say, would you please go and help the neighbor next door and work in their vineyard? Or anything like that. The vineyard was the father's. And eventually, that vineyard would have become the son's. Um, in Jewish law, the oldest son gets two-thirds and the youngest son gets thir one-third, something like that. But eventually, that's what would have happened. They would have, he would have inherited this vineyard. So going to work in the vineyard was not an unreasonable request. In fact, you would have thought they would have chosen, he would have chosen to do it to enhance his inheritance. But he's quite blunt. No question about it. I will not, he answers. But later, he changes his mind. And the word used there is the word that is often translated repents. So he repents. He recognizes that he is heading in the wrong direction. As he leaves his father and goes out, instead of heading towards the vineyard, he heads in the opposite direction. He is not doing what the father wants. He's heading off. And as he's going he realizes that he is headed in the wrong direction. And he turns around and he goes back and he does what the father asks. And the second son says, I will, sir. One of the commentaries I looked at said, look how respectful he is. He uses the word sir. It's almost like he's saying, yep, you're right. I'm happy to do this. You're the boss. I'm going to do what you say and I'm going to go and work in the vineyard. And he does not go. And scripture does not indicate that he even perceives that he has done anything wrong. He somehow thinks that just saying it without doing it is perfectly fine. And you know what? I talked about perception. I want you to think, if somebody else was in the room when the father talked to each of these sons, what would their perception have been of those sons in that instant? What would they have thought about the first son? And what would they have thought about the second son? And it really shows us that sometimes our perception is wrong. But Jesus is so clever. I, he asks this question. Which of the two did what his father wanted? He couldn't get them to answer whether John's baptism was from God or from man. But he's put them in a spot where they have to give an answer. And they answer the first. And I think they're thinking Jesus is going to say, good answer. That's the right answer. Be like that son. But that's not what God says. Well, in a sense, it is what he says, but he doesn't put it quite that way. He says, truly I tell you. Now, this is an insult to these leaders. Let's just put this in context. Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Whoa, wait a minute here. What are you talking about? We're perfect. We're the rulers. We're the leaders. We obey the law. People look up to us. We're wonderful. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. What was John's message? John, part of John's message was, you can read it in, um, John, in Luke 3.3 3 and actually in Matthew 3.3 3 as well. It says, 
he went, John went into all the countryside around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Can you see the religious leaders saying, yep, look at those prostitutes and tax collectors. They really need that message, and they're responding. But we don't need, I don't need that message. I don't need to be baptized. I don't need to repent of my sin. And so they don't respond to John's message. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And what really struck me in this passage was that they said, and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. And what did they see? Well, after these tax collectors and prostitutes and others were baptized by John, they said to John, so now what do we do? And John said, you need to change. If you took too much money, you need to stop doing it. If you're a soldier and you mistreated people and intimidated them, you need to stop. If you're a prostitute, you need to stop. He said, you need to change. And those Pharisees and leaders and rulers of the law would have known who the tax collectors are and probably had a good idea who the prostitutes were and whoever and the soldiers were. And they would have seen this change. They changed after what John said. And it still did not impact their lives. And the second part of John's message was not only to repent and change, but there is one coming after me. He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. John was preparing the way for Christ. And if you could not accept what John said, then there was no way you were going to accept Christ. Jesus is making this point very clear. And you know, if you read the rest of this chapter, you're going to realize Jesus tells another parable. And finally, the priests and the Pharisees and the leaders realize that Jesus is talking about them. It appears that maybe they didn't get it at first. And then they look for a way to arrest him. What Jesus was saying was true. If you cannot accept John and his authority, you will not accept me. I can't answer the question. It's pointless. You will not accept me. And as I looked at this passage, I saw two things that really stood out to me. The first is that no response is a no response. The scribes and Pharisees and chief priests and the leaders and elders had a choice before them. Was John's baptism from heaven or from man? And in choosing not to choose, they think they're safe. But the reality is you must choose Christ. We don't get to become children of God because of the family we're born into. We don't get to become children of God by our own righteous acts. We don't get to become children of God except by admitting that we have done wrong and are separated from God and accepting God's free gift of salvation because of what Jesus did for us when he went to the cross at Calvary and paid the penalty for our sins. And when he went to Calvary, he paid the penalty for our sins, past, present, and future. But we have to say, I want that free gift. I acknowledge that I need that free gift. And I want it, and I'm going to accept it. And all you need to do is say, Lord, I know I've done things that are wrong. And I know I'm separated from you. And today, I accept your offer of a free gift of salvation through Christ Jesus. And I commit my life to him. 
And I ask that your Holy Spirit come in and fill me and enable me to change. And if you have never done that, I urge you to do it today. You have to accept the free gift. It is free, no strings attached, but you have to take it. You will not get it by your actions or your deeds. You won't get it by the church you attend. You won't get it through your inheritance or from your parents. You will not. You must take it. And I urge you to do that today if you haven't, because that is not is what the scribes and Pharisees and the rulers were not willing to do. They were not willing to take that free gift. And they thought they were safe because they were children of Abraham and they obeyed the law. And they saw no need to respond to what John the Baptist said or to what Christ said and did for us. And so if you choose not to, you don't get it. It's no automatic way into, into God's family. You have to accept it. And second, I saw how key repentance is in each of our lives. John's message was repent. And so often, especially in today's society, and it ties in with the concept of perception, telling someone that they are wrong is just totally unacceptable. And I'm going to give you an example. I want you to know that Christine teaches in a school, my daughter, in a school where the kids really struggle, and they have low self-esteem. So as she was preparing to go online and she was preparing an exercise for them, it was an exercise on which one is different. And she actually said to me, remember when you would do it, it would be on Sesame Street, which one is different? If you ever watched it, there's a little jingle that goes with it. It was clear which one was different. But she said, when I make up these, there is no right or wrong answer. And my initial response was, wait a minute. You know, one is different. And she said, well, it's really important. I want my kids, they're grade ones and twos. Uh, they have really low self-esteem. They feel they're not intelligent. I really want them to see, as long as they can tell me why they think one is different, the answer is acceptable. I thought, okay. And then, so here's an example. You have three dogs and a cat. So if I asked you which one is different, without you seeing the picture, you would say cat. But if you looked at the picture, there are two, uh, three, two dogs are green, and the cat is green, and the dog is blue. So someone would say, oh, it's the blue dog that doesn't belong. Or it might be that three of those pictures have two eyes, and the other animal is turned on the side and only has one. And somebody will say, oh, that one doesn't fit because um, th they only have one eye. And in that case, I understand the logic behind teaching that these kids need help to speak and learn. But eventually, at some point, they are going to have to learn that there are things that are right and things that are wrong. But in our society, we do not want that anymore. It is, if I perceive that I am right, then it's your problem if you think I'm wrong. And I want you to think about all those people who, leaders, higher-ups in the scale, political scale, who went on trips over the holiday. Did they know the rules? Some of them made the rules. They knew the rules. But they perceived that their reason for doing it made it okay. And when other people perceived that they did it wrong, they were having trouble understanding that. And that is the society we live in. And so it is essential that we need to perceive when we do things that are wrong. We need to not say, oh, it's okay. From my perspective, it's okay. The perspective we need is from God's perspective. How does God perceive what we are doing? And John came and he called people to repentance. And because they chose repentance, they could then see Christ and his Savior and see him as Savior. So I think repentance um, is required for us to find salvation and become a child of God. 
The other thing I saw in this passage is that um, repentance produces change. Others could see that they were different. And the third thing I saw that repentance did was it uh, impacted others. Although the scribes and Pharisees didn't come to know Christ, I wonder how many of the tax collectors and prostitutes' friends came to know Christ because of the changes in their life. And as I close, two weeks ago, Kathleen talked about how pottery is made. God is the potter, and he made us. Last week, Agnes talked about turning water into wine. And what happens, and that's what happens when we accept Jesus in our lives. We change on the inside. It was what it was inside those pots, the water that became wine. And when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, and we begin to change from the inside out. But the most encouraging thing is that the change becomes visible to others, and that change can draw others to Christ. And so as I was thinking about COVID, my challenge to you today is when we come out of COVID and we can see one another and someone comes up to you as they're bound to do and says, you're different. I can't figure out what's different. Our response will be, thank you for noticing. God has been at work in my life over COVID changing me. And I am so grateful that you can see that change on the outside, whatever it is God has been working on your life. And use that as a stepping stone to share the good news of Christ. I'm going, after I pray, we are going to listen to a song about being changed. Each one of us, when we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, changed. We changed on the inside, and that inside change is being reflected in our outside change. Let's use the changes in our lives to lead others to Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you do change us. You change us into the perfect pot that you intended us to be all along, that perfect vessel. It takes a long time, and I know how stubborn and hard it is to change my heart, Lord, but I know you're there working, and I know you're working in each and every one of our lives. I pray that people around us will see that change and as a result ask us about that change and we will be able to share the good news that they too can change. They just need to commit their lives to Christ. And we just thank you for his willingness to pay the penalty for our sins, to offer us new life and a changed life. In Christ's name. Amen.